Good evening, everyone. And we appreciate uh, your time and effort from all the FDBBI members who are joining and uh, spending time in sharing their knowledge uh, during JVS. It's an honor to introduce Tripti. I was going through her profile and it has inspired me so much. Thank you, Tripti, for your time today. Tripti brings with her more than a decade's experience working as a legal counsel in law firms and in-house companies. She has extensively worked with many clients in the general corporate law space, commercial contracts, labor and employment laws, technology laws, legal due diligences, investments, transaction advisory, mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, corporate restructuring, infrastructure and litigation and legal audits. Her multifaceted professional voyage includes working as a legal counsel and corporate lawyer for a diverse portfolio of clients operating across a broad spectrum of sectors, including IT and IT enabled services, FinTech, pharmaceutical, healthcare. She also is a certified DNI and Porsche trainer Further, she has led complex negotiations and formulated and implemented compliance structures and processes and handheld various startup ventures. Tripti is a university rank holder in BA, LLB honors, degree from Bangalore University and holds LLM in international business laws with again, distinction and a PhD in IPR from the prestigious National Law School of India University, Bangalore. Thank you, Tripti. Over to you. Thank you, Shalini, for making me sound so good in your introduction. I'm just doing a mic check, uh, one, two, three. I am audible to everybody, right? Yes. Yes, so good evening, everybody. And it is my honor and pleasure today to be interacting with you all today. I was a tad bit nervous because most of you here have been, I have seen the interactions and you all have so much of experience and contributions. So I will try and make this as insightful and interesting as I can. But on the flip side, it's also a legal topic. So it tends to have some bit of jargon. So before I start, I just wanted to get a general consist consensus from you all on controlled environment monitoring. How many of us here feel that criminals being monitored in jail is justified or children in school? Just a shout out of a yes or no will help me. Yes, no. Maybe. I think criminal in jail could be, but not kids in school. Okay, so what I wanted to drive to the point is that while there is a negative connotation involved, I will use these analogies, you know, these are the employment framework today during my discussion with you. So without further ado, my topic for today is office surveillance, also known as employee monitoring versus privacy of employees from a legal standpoint. This is an overview of my discussion today. To start with a uh, right to privacy an inherent right. It is a fundamental right guarantee. The Swami judgment touched upon it. And typically as human beings and as a human rights concept, no one likes to be monitored, you know, constantly or kind of have a stalker behavior as if, you know, one is in jail. Also, right to dignity is a fundamental right. Now, this is a human right for all living beings. Even if you are a child, a criminal, a disabled person, or, you know, animals, everybody is entitled to the right to dignity. Now, why did I put these scenarios? Because these are some scenarios where monitoring is usually considered reasonable. An employer-employee relationship is an inherently unequal relationship. Most of us 
even who come from legal field know that you know your employee agreement or your policies are not something you will negotiate it is not a fair level playing field that is you know enabled there unlike a normal social contract where both parties have a option or an opportunity to negotiate so the very concept of equality is covered with a certain unequal uh, you know dynamics in play there in this regard i am examining this concept of employee data and privacy with these factors one is fact which is employee data one is corporate surveillance or employee monitoring which is the action and then we come to the modes and methods which is how is it given and we all know the access we share we give we receive we store and handle employee data in various ways in our working lives this data is predominantly of two types one is personal data which you give expressly explicitly like your contact information your financial information or your medical information which is something you control you have the records and you share this is express the other is implied which is something that uh, your data which is created or generated during the course of your working in the employment field now the consent for both data may be taken expressly under law but the mannerism of obtaining the data differs one is given other is generated now you ask me what is the challenge here consent is taken and it is clear in the first instance where it is explicit express data that i am giving or i have a control of what i share how much i share can i redact there is a specific time period being asked my last employment 3 months bank statement or my last one years health record there is a certain limitation that for a framework that for but the implied data this is generated or created most times the employee himself will not have this data actually we of us would have you know whatever we are being tracked on in our work emails or our locations etc so that is why there is this distinction of express data versus implied data in the employment framework start with workplace surveillance is this comes to the law so where is the controversy what is the issue there are two fundamental rights under the constitution which tend to slightly overlap or conflict here from a legal standpoint one is freedom of profession you are allowed to practice any trade and profession the other one is right to privacy and duty so this is where corporate surveillance has a bit of a legal and an ethical dilemma as you know we go about it and how an organization must approach this now why would an organization have employees monitored we were just discussing super editor and mr ramesh and all of us that you know the nature of work sometimes demands it it is a justified business interest it is legitimate there could be confidentiality risk or data transfer safety and security concerns of your people etc also by or how to go about it in the sense that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy employees are human beings and right to privacy is inherent it is a fundamental right now company policies cannot reduce an employee's personal space or personal life in an employment field one must understand that employees do have personal space so a very simple example is digital signature we all have to give our aadhar card uh, you know the aadhar number for identification fact identification that is followed under it act now that is aadhar is my personal data but we tend to store it on our office system because it is used for you know these purposes sometimes so a good practice is if you keep personal record on your office device mark the folder as personal the office people while taking backup or monitoring cannot touch this folder there is a reasonable expectation of privacy which is expected from an organization that one must respect 
Second thing is company policies must not be absolute. There has to be a sense of balance. You cannot attend personal work in office hours, or you cannot use office devices for personal purposes. We all have seen these policies. Now, what happens when you get a call from home during work hours, assuming you're in office? Or for example, I was just doing, um, trying to send my grocery or to-do list from my phone. But instead of my personal email, by mistake, I sent it from my official email. So what is paramount here is a test of reasonableness. But yes, you're monitoring, there is surveillance, but is the purpose mandated? And how much um, can you actually justify this without, you know, so that it meets the reasonable criteria? Lastly, service providers are also monitoring consumer data. So why can the same not be used in an employment framework? Employee behavior analytics is something that many employers look into. They want to do it. Even something as simple as what time should we declare a lunch? 1 to 2, 1 30 to 2 30, or 2 to 3. So let us study how many employees enter the cafeteria through their access card. What is the rush hour? It is just to monitor behavior, collect data, and come to a certain decision. Consumer uh, facing organizations can do this for business interest. Why not on an employment field? To facilitate corporate surveillance, many modes and methods are used. We were just discussing this again. But there is no shortage of digital tools for employee monitoring. In today's uh, day and age of pandemic, work from home scenario, especially, most of us are more in our digital or online lives rather than our actual physical lives. All our actions are you know, through the apps, through our devices, through our uh, IDs, and all our actions are electronically trailed in some manner or another. Personal space and professional space. There's absolutely no shortage. Multiple services enable stealth monitoring live video feeds, keyboard tracking, we were just mentioning that, optical character recognition, stroke recording, and even location tracking to ensure that the employees are at the client place or not, what time, and such. I have also set out certain other things like social media, etc., because it can be argued that social media is someone's personal space, but of late, they are also being used for business we are seeing controversies on privacy with business account versus personal interactions, etc. Uh, job ads uh, and things are done on professional uh, social media sites. So employee behavior is also monitored. We just discussed a few reasons as to why the company would do it, right? It's legitimate business interest. It's for safety, etc. Now, some of them are advantages. Uh, monitoring gives a clear picture. Like, if I were a manager, to me, I would know who is actually a hard worker and who is unproductive, or it's just working late because you know they think they want to show that they are working longer hours, etc. Especially in the work from home scenario, this is something that most supervisory and managerial people are looking at. So one is um, employee monitoring to uh, determine efficiency of an employee. And many organizations also feel that this is a way to maintain quality assurance of their service or their product, ensure there is some sense of uniformity and constant monitoring so that there is no compromise on quality. And also to keep up with competitors. A legitimate business interest and reputation of an organization because the more you monitor and you have clarity and you are uh, you know sort of uh, regulating an employee's activities it tends to show that an organization has a very good uh, deliverable it's a uh, very good coordination among teams everybody knows what other teams are doing it comes across as a very cohesive well-organized good production team you know be seamless 
and that adds also to reputation of an organization. There are no gaps there. There is safety of people, safety of property, security reasons of uh, you know your assets. Many of us have not even visited our office in about six months, one year. Now we don't know. So surveillance also helps as a safety, security precaution of people and property both. From a legal standpoint, this is the most critical point to me that it is a way to monitor employees' actions and wrongdoings. Because an employer is responsible in many actions, in many cases for the actions of the employees. Most contracts and most laws mandate that employer is responsible for an action by an employee. Which is one of the reasons we have so many company policies which have all these restrictions of don't do this or this can be done. Because employer does, how would one regulate human behavior after a certain point? So corporate surveillance is a very good way for an organization to protect itself as a legal defense and also from reputational damage to make sure that employees are monitored. So in case there is any wrongdoing, one either by monitoring or by electronic record, the same as evidentiary, it has evidentiary value and it can be tracked and dealt with. On the same lines, now are the disadvantages. Because now we come to the element which is non-organizational, where the employee is the recipient of the surveillance or the one being monitored. Some reasons why corporate surveillance is disadvantages are that they create adverse working conditions. Uh, apart from ethical and legal dilemmas, which are sometimes very gray and we don't know how to you know, actually deal with it, there are trust issues between uh, supervisor or a subordinate or even within teams. And I feel at a personal level, anybody would feel very stressed out if someone is constantly being monitored. Now, unlike other scenarios that we just mentioned, like uh, if it is children or if it is uh, criminals in a jail, etc., it has a certain sense of reasonableness there, right? That these are people who have, in some way, they require it or they have asked for it. But in a professional environment, we are all qualified, we are adults, so why do we need constant monitoring? And that feeling decreases a person's productivity, causes a certain mental burnout. If you're constantly being, you know, stopped and monitored and every action you do, every stroke of your key is recorded and you don't even have access to this data. So I think that is a bit of a fear psychosis that goes on in people's minds. And now the big question is how much of it is actually ethical? So these are some disadvantages that can make an employee feel very bound or, or a very uh, curtailed in his you know, freedom to practice his work the way he wants to. Different people have different uh, competencies and capabilities. Somebody learns very fast or is, has a certain skill set. Somebody may not have. And this may also create a comparative uh, you know, reasoning between employees when it comes to appraisals or promotions, etc., which actually affect productivity and efficiency is one of the studies that I was just you know, reading up and they said that this is also disadvantages. Okay, so now I will briefly walk you through the case which actually brought to light the issue of corporate surveillance versus right to privacy in an employment framework. This is a 2017 case, just about before the GDPR, you know, into force. But in this case, in their judgment, they used this case to provide proper specific guidelines for employers which align with the United Nations, with Council of Europe standards and EU laws like GDPR. The case in brief is the applicant is one Mr. Babalistu. He had been dismissed from his job at a private company after disciplinary proceedings in which his instant messenger chats sent from work computer were read by his employer, allowed under company policy to, to corroborate the fact that he used office device for personal purpose. The case went on uh, against the uh, uh, state of Romania, 
country of Romania. So it went on from the lower court. And finally, the grand chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, which is like a full bench equivalent for us in the Supreme Court, they gave a judgment. And in their decision, they held that the authorities, which is the state of Romania in this case, the authorities failed to ensure the right to privacy in employment relationships. While there was a company policy, Mr. Bablis too did violate it. The extent and nature, I repeat, the extent and nature of the monitoring was unjustified. I have it on screen. I'm also reading it out from the decision. Workers do not abandon their right to privacy and data protection every morning at the doors of the workplace. New technologies may find into employees' private life, both easier for the employer and harder for the employee to detect. The risk being aggravated by the contractual inequality of the employment relations. A human rights-centered approach to internet usage in the workplace warrants a transparent internal regulatory framework, a consistent implementation policy, and a proportionate enforcement strategy by employers. I have provided the case link for reference in case anybody does want to refer to it. Hey, Tripti, I have a request. There is, it seems there is some connectivity issue uh, from uh, your side. Can you move a little closer to the system or uh, uh, bring it closer so that we are able to, because your flow is helpful, we are able to understand what you're saying, but uh, in between um, the volume goes uh, low because of the connectivity. So if you could keep the system closer to you. I have also just off video so that the echo is cut out. Please let me know if this is better now. Yes. Yeah, I think I think this is much better, Tripti. Yeah, great. Okay. Do I need to repeat the previous slide? Any points that I need to go back to? No, I think you will not necessary. Yes. We may continue. continue. You have got your uh, intentions. Don't have to worry. Go ahead, madam. You are doing well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So, this we just uh, examined was obviously in the EU law context. Uh, but I think inherent right of uh, privacy and dignity is common to all human rights charter. It's an internationally accepted principle in laws. And most constitutions um, recognize this. So um, in line with that, now I'm coming to the Indian law scenario. Now there is a governance and compliance scenario. Right? Just now, uh, Subaraidu Sir and Mr. Ramesh were discussing the nature of work demands that corporate surveillance is needed. Many times, certain service industries and sectors require this. Now, under Indian law scenario, apart from directly work related aspects, the nature of work, there are certain other cases where employer may you know, typically cross boundaries, impacting employee privacy in these situations. Disciplinary proceedings, compliances, misconduct, uh, complaints of sexual harassment, etc. Reason being that for complying with these laws and having a governance framework as an organization, they have to determine and go through a lot of data uh, and a lot of information which is private to the employee. For example, in posh proceedings, chats and emails between both parties are read to determine whether there is truth to any complaint. And sometimes this content has very explicit or, uh, you know, uh, unparliamentary uh, you know, images or content involved. So the idea is that right to dignity, right to privacy is to be respected as regards the nature and service that is true. As an organization, there are ancillary reasons also. Because all of these uh, grievance and uh, compliance related uh, governance framework apply irrespective of which sector and industry. So, my take on this is that maybe the you know the degrees could vary, but by and large there has to be a certain framework which is justified. The image I used uh, is a little harsh uh, in the sense uh, given the topic that we are dealing with. And what I wanted to emphasize is not just on privacy but also. 
from a human rights perspective, privacy and dignity are intertwined. For example, in Indian law, a rape victim name is never made public. We all know the Nirbhaya case. It was named Nirbhaya. That is not the real name of the rape victim. So post-Indian PDP coming into force, the employment framework, I think, will sit, uh, set out new precedents, especially given the governance framework we are looking at, apart from express data collection. Also, one point here is that data protection laws are typically applicable to body corporates. But right to privacy is enforceable against private persons as well. So this is a fundamental right. So it goes beyond, a little beyond the data protection statute operation, and that is something employers must bear in mind, especially when creating the policies. Now, what I have done is, um, is uh, you know, seeing the situation from the case law, the recommendations that were given by the court, what the GDPR sets out, what is proposed in the PDP bill, etc. There are just certain best practices or recognized global laws, uh, you know, that I've just listed out which can be used in terms of corporate surveillance. Uh, notice is one of them. Notice is an important factor. As an organization, be transparent. What data is collected? Fact of monitoring, nature and extent of surveillance. All of these must be clearly mentioned in the notice and consent in writing expressly is key. A very critical element here is degree of inclusion. An employer may be justified in reading a business email, but not a personal mail sent from office side. If a less invasive form of surveillance is possible, it is preferable and advisable to use a less invasive form. My personal take is that, um, absolutely my personal view, that dignity is a step above privacy. While they are intertwined and used synonymously, but I think uh, there is a slight one step above when it comes to dignity. For example, in our case law study that we just saw, the court considered reading of employees' personal chats as unjustified. Even if it was on work device, there was a valid company policy. The fact that the employee used office device or system for personal use was misconduct as per policy, enough for the employer to act. He need not have read private tax. So the degree of inclusion is very critical in uh, aspects of corporate surveillance of, uh, you know, as against employees. And most importantly, justify the inclusion. It could be legitimate business interest, confidentiality reasons, security reasons, and there has to be a lawful purpose, a legitimate business interest that is coming out. Certain other things that must be kept in mind is, as organizations, we have multiple policies. And sometimes, legally, they overlap. Laws overlap. Because the intent is the same, right? All the laws are trying to protect uh, you know, fundamental rights or freedoms of uh, employees or organizations have a uh, you know, certain set rules. The idea is to ensure that all the policies are aligned. So in, in the garb of corporate surveillance or employee monitoring, please ensure that there is no bias created in terms of race or gender or any discrimination, etc. Because while it can be a legitimate interest, it cannot be something that goes against the overall governing framework as well. On one side, your policy says we are an equal opportunity, and on the other side, there is corporate surveillance which is causing discrimination. You will have to conflict in policy. So that is something that should be kept in mind as an organization level, especially today in the diversity and inclusion world. These are certain sensitive points that come into picture based on a person's private space and purpose. In certain critical cases, please have the right of opting out by an employee. For example, if he doesn't want to share something which is very personal, again, the rationale of degree of inclusion is something that must be applied here. These are just recommended as prevalent best practices. And the law, uh, I mean, obviously, once PDP comes into place, how this will work in the employment framework is something I think that is still to be examined. There are technical tools to address this. 
there's a legitimate reason to address this there is a law coming into force which is protecting it and there is another uh, you know the constitution and fundamental rights which have already the framework but how the all of these will flow together i think in an indian legal scenario i feel it still to be seen there are no precedents to this as on date but it would be interesting in my view what i leave you with personal data given by consent is open what about the implied personal data which even the employee doesn't have or does not have control fundamental right of not just privacy but also dignity must be paramount versus legitimate business interest so a balance mechanism is something that needs to be put in place a test of reasonableness must be established and principle of proportionality a degree and extent of surveillance and intrusion must be factored into by organizations and have express policies in this regard apart from just consent and notice employment by its nature can be regulated yes is contractual yes but it cannot reduce a person's private social life in a workplace to zero thank you any questions any thoughts i'm happy to hear you Shalini, um, I thought Mr. You... Kodandram wanted to say yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. I don't want. I just tell his. So you unmuted, so I thought you yeah, wanted to say. Unmuted because yeah. I am lacking certain technological knowledge. Somehow it has become. It is an aberration. Okay, I enjoyed the talk. It was very much useful. Let me learn. Others can. And my apologies. I am. I am missing the chats now for head. Well, your phone and this, but it seems to be my Wi-Fi seems to be a little sketchy today. So please pardon me. I don't know whether it's. The power. I mean, you mentioned before you started, so I could share that in the chat that there is some connectivity uh, issue at your location. No problem about that. Um, yes, if you want me to revisit any slide or any concept, just please let me know, and I will, you know, take you back to that. Trupti, uh, Mark has given us Trupti. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Thank Very good. So coming from you, thank you so much. So, Tripti, I mean, it's been um, um, like you know the way you could put how uh, uh, a person would feel in such simplistic terms like uh, jail feeling or mental burnout. It really puts the point uh, across really well. Namit had few uh, questions. Namit, could you? Uh, Ask uh, directly. Namit, would you read? Uh, hi, hi, Jyoti. Namit here. Uh, I uh, when you were mentioning the word monitored, in in most of the slides, this was used. Uh, can you can you you know explain as to what exactly is being you know contain contained within the specifics of the word monitored? Like, are the keystrokes? Is it a screen recording? What exactly is you know what are the people uh, exactly doing currently and to what extent this is being done currently yes so i can answer this uh, more from the i wouldn't say a legal standpoint but more from the tools that i was you know seeing that various employers are using now but you know they have something called live video feeds apparently there are organizations which mandate that during this time to this time you, you have to be in front of your computer and your video must be on you must follow the sentiment of as if you are in office let's say 95 even in a work from home scenario and we just discussed the keystroke and i have also heard that some of them have enable location tracking because they are going for client meeting or client search so apparently there are all these tools uh, that are in the market so when i use the word monitoring or surveillance i did mention that i'm using them synonymously the reason being that every action and every step is not absolutely mandated right some organizations may be using some things and some may be using something it is the intention of the organization that there is monitoring happening and there is surveillance uh yeah, yes uh, referring uh, to the case of uh, romania what you mentioned in your slide correct uh that case uh, uh we can say safely that it was uh, crossing the line for monitoring uh yes, 
That's correct, but that is the point, right? Like till it came to brand chamber, the judgment was only looked at as yes, he used company devices, and in fact, the employer justified that. The defendant's statement in this was that unless I read the chats, how will I know that he is using it for a personal purpose? Correct. He has to hmm. read it to establish that. So ah. that is where the policy played a very important role because you are monitoring policy. They had a policy, very good. Employee knows there is a policy, very good. But the way it was looked at was the policy says you cannot use office device for personal work. So the very fact that it was personal, you could stop. There was no requirement to further get into establish the degree of how much personal or what personal was used. Okay. Uh... In case of India, do we have any such regulations as far as to what kind, to what degree, and what extent an employer can, you know, do a monitoring? Do we have anything in place? So PDP has a section, if I remember, uh, yes, I think under Indian law, section thirteen deals with personal data in employment, but that is only regarding data protection. Now the issue with monitoring is it's an action, right? Now, the data is not being monitored. It is an hmm. individual by virtue of the data who is being monitored. So that is why I did mention that this will, I think, come through precedence. I did uh, try to find something which could be looked in the data protection realm in an employment framework, but I haven't seen anything. But if you do have something hmm. in mind, I'm happy to see that. Uh, no, I mean, this 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 thing, actually, I, I came across an idea, uh, you know, just while you were talking about it, which is my second question in the in the chat. This basically says, let's say there's a scrupulous employee who is working and uh, and we have uh, uh, national databases of employees like National Skills Registry uh, or the NASCOMS database where people are pre-screened and the employment history is maintained and it's a it's a good system where the uh, uh, an employee can employee's history can be figured out like whether this employee is fit for a specific job profile or not so such systems have employees details with them like not only pers not only professional but on certain, on certain uh, in some cases, personals as well. So let's ex let's say, for instance, an, a, a scrupulous employee is blacklisted. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Like, uh, let's say it's a data. Let's say it's a national skills registry. Now they have blacklisted the employee. What happens to the privacy of that individual now? Um, because the database data still exists and it is exposed to other uh, employers as well, but it is marked as a blacklisted employee or it might not come at all, depending on the implementation of the system. Okay. So let's say it comes up, it shows that the black employee is blacklisted. So uh, is this a violation of his privacy? I mean, uh, because his personal names, his identification is being exposed as and not and it might uh, and this might affect his job prospects in future yes, so again this is not a case of surveillance right it is data protection collection and storage now this will again hmm. fall this will fall under a separate policy of each organization as to what they do with employee data how long do you retain it how do you expand it what do you do it and mm -hmm. uh, the very same fact also has an overlap at a if you are asking in an employment framework. It's a larger question whether right to forget mm. should exist once the purpose mm. is fulfilled, right? Mm. So yeah. I think that that would be a different subject matter once the data protection law actually comes into practice and how it will be treated and whether a collected uh, factors of personal data sitting with somebody impact privacy because there is consent element, there is lawful mm. purpose element, and okay. there is a timeline element. Thanks. So yeah, in this case, I think my concern more was from, I get where you're coming from because there is this slight, you know, all the data that is generated and created, then what do you do with that? Yes. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a gray area. Yeah. Yes. yes, and it is a legal and an ethical dilemma. I'll be very honest with that. Even when I was trying to find definitive, there are many cases where I saw that how do you draw a line, uh, you know, as to what actually falls within legal um framework that is being created for employment purpose because still now nobody even questions surveillance right to be honest we all know we all have cctvs we all know our uh, office mails are tracked and it was considered legitimate business interest sounds good thank you
I mean, uh, having a legislative uh, guideline on this is always helpful. And uh, under European law, employers are not uh, supposed to maintain list of blacklisted uh, employees, prospective employees. I mean, they can always uh, refer to the government's database, but themselves, they cannot maintain it. And uh, Ms. Ms. Bengeri, would you like me to read the question you have or uh, you go ahead and go read? Ahead. I have a bad signal here. Okay. Sure. So Ms. Bengeri's question is legitimate interest is a very common lawful basis that employers use for collecting and processing personal data. By definition of the term, is this most widely used basis for processing and adequately addresses protection of privacy of individuals? Ms. Bengeri, your answer is in your question, legitimate interest and lawful basis. But exactly the point I was trying to drive home that, you know, if it is collected data and there is a lawful purpose, which your notice mentions, your privacy statement mentions, and it is policy regulated, yes. But when it comes to surveillance, they are not just using the personal data you give them, right? Nobody is really taking your Aadhaar number or your birth date. It is your actions and your day-to-day -day actions which are getting recorded. And that is also your personal data, your voice, your finger movement, your behavior pattern. Uh, you may be browsing some pages, etc. So while I understand lawful basis in the realm of law that nobody is visiting any site or page which is not required for professional purposes, or it is being done outside of work hours or within work hours, or office instant messengers are not being used for non-professional conversations, etc. But I think it is also difficult as to tell where the line crosses because if two people are using official resources, whether it is the internet or office device, or even a WhatsApp group created for an office project purpose, and two people are having a personal conversation there and something goes wrong there, then how do you decide whether it is lawful or not? So my take on that is protection of an organization, which should best be captured in your policy. What is your intent? What do you plan to do? And most critical, as I mentioned, is that corporate surveillance is legal. So nobody's questioning that. It is the degree of intrusion that must be established. So what is the query? And how much do we need to get into it to disturb someone's privacy? Those lesser invasive methods is preferable, advisable, enough to prove a point, protect an organization. But don't not to overdo it so that a person's privacy and dignity is set. Absolutely, Triti, like you already mentioned that you know reasonableness and proportionality has to be considered whenever an employer is considering such means yes absolutely by degree, uh, by degree of intrusion i do mean proportionality and the test of reasonableness is i think uh, i mean goes without saying but thank you uh, um, i think i want to make a point yeah uh, in banking industry, particularly in public sector banks, there is a uh, employment condition is there that officers and above category employees of the bank has to submit annual return of assets and liabilities, not only in his own name, but also in the family member's name. So this was a employment regulation condition put at the time of employment. And of course, the bank will not uh, open everybody's statement but randomly every year, uh, HR department opens a uh, covers and it cross verifies whether the submitted asset liability details are correct or not. That is one point. Secondly, whenever there's a case, any employee found to misbehaving or done some fraud or some illegal bank, English bank regulation or bank service regulations, they file a case. In such cases also, uh, courts accepted this particular statement of asset liability as evidence to prove that employee is guilty. At that time, no court has said that this monitoring is illegal in India. I think uh, Vijayasinghe and Navisar will be able to throw more light on that particular aspect because Sir also came from a public sector bank. Sir, what is your view, sir, on this? Our, uh, even, if, even if the evidence is illegal, uh, illegally collected, it is accepted as evidence uh, in the court. That is the view of the court. That is. Even if the means of collection of evidence is not regular, still it can be used as evidence. Tripti, am I correct? Yes. Also, there is an element of consent, right? You are consenting to provide that information. 
Now, this uh, data protection angle, privacy angle is a new development in India. So earlier cases, uh, it would not have been uh, highlighted. And even if it is highlighted, uh, one has to wait two things. See, one, the evidence becomes acceptable and one case actually proceeds. Then if the collection of evidence uh, is illegal, then that is a different issue on which a cause of action is different. And that will be a parallel issue which will uh, separately be perhaps uh, discussed. The other point, I think maybe, I don't know the, the, the facts of the case, if it is self-incriminating for the same person, maybe, I don't know, there, there would be other, another issue which he may um, raise that his rights were infringed. And with that, some self-incriminating evidence was collected would be one argument, perhaps. Maybe other lawyers can ex explain that better. Now we said. Yeah. Now in PDPB, hmm. there is a provision for the individual to ask the uh, controller to delete the data. Correct. Right, sir. Now, yeah. under this circumstance, this law uh, of enactment of the law, if I imply the case, what we are saying, uh, can you ask the bank to uh, delete the entire uh, asset liability statement? No, no, no. Be... no, no. He can ask. Okay, bank has to contend that it is required for uh, its uh, uh, record keeping, which can be legitimate interest or uh, fraud prevention or its own legal interest. Because anyway, there is limitation period of minimum three years. Okay, then uh, it may be extended because of various reasons. So we don't know when an issue will come up. And um, I say, after all, in India, right to delete rightfully has now been made into a quasi judicial aspect. You will not uh, delete it as on your own. You take it to the adjudicator. Adjudicator has to decide. Um, and at that time, uh, the company can uh, uh, say challenge the deletion and uh, the order can be that it will be archived securely or something like that so that the data is not deleted. Remember, Information Technology Act says that even in other cases of intermediary rules, six months mm -hmm. you have to keep the data. That is the law now. If somebody uh, opens an account and next moment <coughs> he closes the account, which happens in mobile apps. Many times we um, uh, install a mobile app, two minutes later we delete it. Now that company has to keep that uh, uh, information to exactly. the person for six months. This is a, a law of evidence now, actually. It is evidence as required under Information Technology Act. So there is uh, a support to law enforcement uh, by all these things, and we should respect it. Privacy can still be protected by ensuring that that information is protected and it is not left to flow freely. It is kept secure. Um, and uh, somebody will take responsibility in the organization. You better have a data custodian for archived uh, um, data and show your commitment that the data will be protected in the interest of the individual as well as in the interest of the law enforcement and other things. So some procedure for uh, that kind of data retention uh, as a policy has to be developed. Uh, sir, not the data retention part I'm asking. When employee retires or separates on designation, even on the other right hand, don't you think that it is required for a couple of more years? So disputes may come several years later um, about his salary payments or excess payments. We don't know. You are talking of assets and liabilities. There could be a, a fraud uh, case. So there will be a reasonable time, maybe a minimum of three years, because civil cases at least will expire after three years. Um, then uh, I think um, we should uh, exercise caution before it, uh, data is deleted. But who, because once deleted, you are losing that uh, evidence forever. So uh, nobody knows when it will be required. You see in India, criminal cases take 10 years, uh, even sometimes to surface. So. One has to be circumspect on exercising this right to uh, forget, and uh, you have to distinguish it from uh, the um, right to remove it from the active uh, servers. That is always there. The moment purpose is over, please remove it from the active server and um, archive it uh, with encryption, strong encryption. Have a data custodian who will be given the custody of that data so that um, you can always justify, even in a court, that uh, we have kept it for a particular um, legitimate interest. Now, whether that should be three years or one year, 
that is a matter of debate i think the industry will have to slowly develop their norm okay but i think minimum 3 years because of the limitation period is uh, essential uh, uh, to to me it appears i am a more a cyber crime uh, kind of a person so i don't know uh, the other privacy activists may have a different uh, view point yes through mm -hmm. you have something to say on this Yes, Navi sir, I agree with you. What to extend very technically? Also legally, I think there is one factor. Uh, in my slide, also I mentioned that in most cases, employers are liable for the behavior of employees. So this can also come up at a later stage. So there are two, you know, key uh, phases we all are using. One is legitimate business interest, and another one is a lawful purpose. They are not synonymous legally. When I read them from a legal English hat. A legitimate business interest is only your reason for collecting the data, but why and what and how that data is going to be processed is a lawful purpose. Today, my lawful purpose may be just for a behavior analytics. Tomorrow, it could be to defend myself in a criminal case. Lawful purpose changes. So, as a legitimate business interest of an organization, there is a bit of an overlap. I understand that, but we need to be looked at with a little bit of a fine comb, you know. Especially if it is not a continuous employment, as you said, post termination, etc., then or post retirement, as you know, Navi sir was also mentioning that you still need to retain this data. At that point in time, there is no legitimate business interest there; it is lawful purpose because your business interest in an employment framework is now deleted, right? It's not there anymore. But it is for uh, organizational uh, protection. It is for reputational damages. So uh, those are the elements that have to come. And Navi sir, I agree with you for three years solely because this, this will also add to uniformity of multiple enactments and legal remedies. I feel if there are conflicts between laws, matters take a longer time to resolve for authorities. So the uniformity will help. Uh, you know that uh, all laws are common because if somebody deletes it in a law which says uh, one year, then yeah. so what is the yeah. There is a possibility that um, some case may be filed against a person, and we used to say in bank that one has to check even less pendants register. I don't know whether that kind of a register is still uh, present now. We used to call it as less pendants register. That is uh, pending cases in the court. Okay, I don't know whether such a thing is uh, there now, but um, there could be such things. Uh, so one has to be alert to such kind of possibilities, and. Um, Uh, ensure that the system supports that because law enforcement is everybody's responsibility <laughs> okay but i am not mentioning from the point of the individual no yeah. sir yeah. i am discussing the from the point of the bank what type of bank has to modify their procedures and they get me more uh, alert about, about the company bank has to keep financial records for uh, say 7 years now or 10 right. years now 7 years sir his assets and liabilities as an employee you have paid him salary that goes through the bank account so seven years anyway he has uh, that uh, the information has to be kept sir that asset liability my background is if the person get any illegal money through some other means through bank in uh, case, in case you, are, you have any suspicion then it becomes uh -huh. an evidence for a potential criminal evidence it should never be deleted if it is deleted i will file a case against the bank for suppression of evidence yeah. sir shall i add Yeah, yeah. it is not. Yeah. You cannot make a common rule. I'll give you an example where really I could come to rescue one lady. She had uh, her husband working in the military. They retired, and he was getting pension from defense as well as from my department. After retirement, uh, before uh, this one, he had uh, after nearly fifteen years, he passed away. She wanted her pension to be fixed. Unfortunately, this person has not included in our departmental pension. Now she, from last five years, she was struggling because I am the secretary for pensioners association. She approached me. Then I used my good office, went into office rooms, and we checked that record, which was kept in a very sealed place. It was more than thirty, twenty-five years ago. He has retired, but the document we could get it. When I placed it before the chief commissioner, he happily signed it and said. and this month she is getting her pension why i am telling is it depends upon the situation you need not keep in open the data need not be removed data may not may be removed from the day to day operations but they should be archived depending upon the situations that exist in that particular working atmosphere even you can not say all government services 
all this one especially if we are in the investigating wing they keep it for few even 50 years 100 years in some old cases we keep a track of this smugglers grandfather we have got it so one fellow who has died 10 years ago we are able to capture him in mangaluru very recently so it is not that easy to have one rule and formulate saying that after 3 years or 5 years such the agencies need to have that kind of information but this should not be in the public usage you it can be archived when it is not required it could be archived and where exactly it is not necessary they can have their own rules and they can do that that's the opinion you cannot have a common rule it will be very very difficult to sustain life okay thank you sir hi itripti um miss bengali has a quick question um which is do family members of employee fall under purview of pdpb and to be qualified as data principals so my take on that is anyone's personal data under pdpb is going to be uh, you know a personal data whether it's employee customer family member next of kin if it is personal data of an individual which is identifiable and connectable to an individual all the data protection uh, you know the rules and protections that are applicable will become applicable to this data and most of us in our forms do have next of kin emergency contact which are family members address house address change of address so i think it, there is a legal lawful basis to it also No, I wanted to share that Mr. Anil Chiplankar has shared few uh, yeah, a couple I of resources. So members can please refer to it uh, after the session. And actually, uh, I would uh, yes, Tripti. No, thank you, Mr. Chiplankar. Actually, just I'll I like the point that you made because I was recently dealing with a posh matter where it was a romance gone sour, you know, between a manager and his subordinate. and after which she filed a posh complaint and it was very interesting because the concept of relationship policies in an organization came in we recommended that they draft a proper relationship policy because this is not statutorily regulated correct unless it's a married couple then yes marriage by statute is recognized but in non married couples uh, how do you have relationships which are crossing the boundary of professional because when these complaints come and you have to look into their personal realm is right of privacy which is triggered but there is also lawful purpose for it because there is a complaint made etc and as you rightly said there has to be a relationship policy which regulates whether an organization allows it doesn't allow it what happens and one key observation in this very interestingly was a declaration be made to hr if it is really official and serious since live in relationships are also recognized under law that a declaration be made that they are unmarried but living together married but living together and your employee date of your address your residential address status next of kin nominee all of this changes but now once uh, there's a breakup in the picture and again you have to report it now there is something of right to privacy as to why should i report to my employer who i'm dating or who are, you know i am not dating but it was considered that since it has an organizational impact and certain other laws are coming into place a policy of declaration be made but be kept confidential so unless needed to not be called upon which also from the banking sector example we were just discussing that it need not be active it need not be made public binded by confidentiality and Thank you I, for sharing these. Even I will go through them. I want to now request Miss Meena Lal. Miss Meena Lal prepared the FTBBI white paper on corporate uh, surveillance. I want to request uh, Miss Lal to give the closing comments. Okay, thanks, Shalini. Tripti uh, at the outset, thank you very much for bringing in an enterprising subject. Um. a few thoughts if i can express with your permission this is surveillance actually conveys it's a very negative connotation and it conveys the idea of supervision and close observation you know when you talk to children who are adolescent or have grown up they will tell you stop micromanaging so an employer cannot afford to micromanage the activities of employees so basically where do you draw the line is a question and 
<clears throat> you know, we spoke quite a bit, and as Mr. Kodandaram said, there cannot be anything uniform, which is indeed so true. Everything in this sphere has to be completely contextual and situationally applied. None of this can be written enough. Human dignity can and protection of human dignity can never be written enough. We are born with dignity and we all know that. Dignity is so much inherent. It is too inherent to be written enough about, whether this way or that <laughs> is what I would wish to say. And you know, <clears throat> the, the thing is that there is a very thin membrane between a due diligence of a person who is look, being looked upon as a prospective employee and the surveillance and protection of dignity. There is a very, very membranous dividing line amongst the, these concepts. <clears throat> uh, you know, Justice Chandrachur, in very recent past, he passed a judgment. In the judgment, he said something very beautiful. He said, the legislature, not all legislation, does not always say everything on the subject. Legislative silences create spaces for creativity. Between intercises of legislative spaces and silences, the law is shaped by robust application of common sense. So, and I quote Justice Chandrachur, uh, Chandra this was a quote from his judgment, which is a 2021 judgment uh, of Supreme Court. So, you know, it is, it is actually true that the common sense has to be so much evolved amongst human race that we are able to distinguish between what is privacy, what is surveillance, and how to protect the dignity of people. The data may still be, the company that prescribes the data to be retained for seven years. So the employers or the, uh, the organizations will have the authority to retain the data for so and so time. But fact of the matter is it cannot be, it can be used as you rightly said for lawful purpose only and for defending itself as Mr. Navi also said. So <clears throat> these are concepts which have always existed just that what brings this table to this table, this point for discussion is the mode which has changed. So surveillance has always been talked about. The medium has been changing all the time and it becomes, it makes, the degree of intrusion higher or lesser depending upon the medium. So that's why the subject is being talked about and this subject will always, till the time human race exists, this subject will, surveillance will always be talked about. So Tripti, thank you very much for bringing in an enterprising subject, which really provokes the human mind because after all, this is a subject which applies to each one of us individually. So thanks a lot for sharing your concepts, your recommendations with us. I'm sure everybody here would benefit um, in their own way uh, from wherever they want to look at the issue, you know, look at the subject. So thanks a lot from on behalf of all of us here, on behalf of FDPI, I take the opportunity to thanks, thank you profusely. Thank you.